Well, thank you everybody for coming. This is going to be a great speaker today. Um, I'm filling in. I'm Lindsay Volcaddy, Assistant Director of the Archives. Usually your host is Kim Kahn, and she's on vacation this week, so good for her. Um, today our speaker is Caleb Scarberry. He is a field geologist slash petrologist with primary interests in igneous processes, including volcanic deposits and ore formation. He has worked at the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology for 10 years. His work involves geologic mapping, rock sampling, and bulk geochemistry and geochronology for quadrangle scale field studies. That's a lot of, a lot of big words there. Scarberry holds a BS in geology and anthropology from Central Washington University and a graduate and graduate degrees in geology from Idaho State and Montana State University. Or not Montana State, Oregon State University. So welcome and thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me back here. Uh, this is the second time I've been here to present. The first time is uh, real shortly after I got here, so I've learned a lot since then. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, different rocks. I'm really excited to be here right now because there's a lot happening uh, with my research. I think the talk advertised something about volcanic and igneous rocks around Butte. We can talk about that, but there's so much more um, going on right now with my research team at the Bureau. Um, I know everybody's interested in the igneous rocks around here, and that's really what I started cutting my teeth on when I got here, walking around the Boulder Bathlith. It's a uh, Cretaceous age uh, intrusive suite uh, that really is responsible for a lot of the mineral deposits that we have regionally. Uh, so late Cretaceous, we're talking about 85 to maybe 60 million years ago. Uh, we're dealing with that uh, compressive, shortening, uh, intrusive mineralizing period out here in Montana. Uh, and then the whole thing is followed by extension and breakup of that mountain range. And there's a whole other style of volcanic activity that cuts and fills right in between the Cretaceous system, and that would be the Eocene Lowland Creek Volcanic Field. A good example of the Eocene, you can see right on the campus of Butte, okay? Uh, the M Hill. And so when I first got here, that was the, the really the focus of my work. Let me see if I can get this on in a good spot. Okay, hopefully this will work. I'll try to talk loud. Okay, good. Everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so really, this this mapping that I've done um, really turned into something else in about 2019. As I mentioned, I was hired to be a, a, a quadrangle scale geologic mapper. Really specialized set of skills, boots on the ground, go and cover as much terrain as you can. You take a map similar to like you would take hunting. So that's what I mean when I say quadrangle. We're talking about the seven and a half minute, one to 24,000 series. Uh, it's about 60 square miles, uh, you know, and in these kind of terrains, it's a challenge. It's a lot of fun. Um, got to see a lot of really neat rocks, but about 2019, I could see that my career trajectory was changing a little bit, and it was driven by this kind of sense of urgency that I could feel for critical minerals. Okay, now it's kind of out in the open now. I think everybody's aware of, of the issues. Um, but I was, I was really focused on this back in 2019, and specifically because I, I was, by this point, really aware of the, of the vast mining history, the really rich mining history uh, in Montana, as well as I had an understanding of, of the types of uh, mineral systems that created these deposits. And you know, this is all a result of my work. So I was able to kind of easily transition into the critical minerals game uh, several years ago. And so what I'm gonna to present to you now is really the payoff of that transition. We've really built something, I think, really neat up at the Bureau right now. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm uh, kind of leading this effort here. We also have uh, a, a Billings office or satellite office in Billings. Uh, Jay Gunderson there is the primary geologist He's also a PI on a couple DOE projects that I'll talk about related to energy, uh, mainly in eastern Montana. Now we have Adrian Van Reithoven. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped Ryan. Ryan's also out in Billings working on coal, um, 
and other energy oil projects, uh, rare earths in coal, that kind of thing out there. I'll show you some uh, examples of his work here towards the end. And then two new hires, uh, Dr. Van Rijthoven uh, is an economic geologist. He's got a couple projects that he's leading up at the Bureau right now. Uh, and then Kyle Eastman, who's a, a mid-career, a really talented economic geologist that we got out here from Tasmania. And so it's been really a, a thrill to have him out here. He's really excited uh, to be back. He did his master's degree out here with Chris Gammons. Uh, so he's like a, like a pig in mud out here. He's in great time. Okay, so here's just kind of a real simple version of, of the state view of our resources. Okay, this is what we have in the state. Uh, so we're showing active mines as of 2020. Uh, those are the big ones, they're not real clear. Uh, you got the main one here in Butte, right, the Continental. Um, you got the Highland, Highland Mine. There's several mines spread around uh, western Montana. The high slash moderate mineral potential, all minerals. This is incredibly vague. Okay, what this is showing you is really the Cretaceous magma system intruding into older rocks. Where it intrudes into carbonates, it oftentimes reacts with the carbonates. Okay, so around the edges of a lot of these Cretaceous intrusions where they where they come into carbonates, we see these nice little scarns and all kinds of other weird mineral deposits. Okay, so you know, I hope that's impressive in Montana that we've got, you know, quite a big band of where of places we could be expecting to find some of these obscure critical commodities. Um, phosphoria formation, okay, phosphoria is kind of a shallow inland sea uh, that would, existed during the Permian. It's completely deformed in Montana. Uh, it goes into Idaho, it goes into Wyoming. Um, but this is an old shallow seabed uh, where we've got organic material accumulating. Uh, and then also some really strange critical commodities are occurring in with those deposits. Uh, so that's what Adrian's looking at, it's the phosphoria to see what the rare earth potential is. We've also got along the Montana-Idaho border, I think a lot of you guys have heard of Sheep Creek maybe by now, with all the rare earth deposits out in Sheep Creek. They're in carbonatite veins. Carbonatites are really low temperature magmas um, that are loaded with calcium. Um, so the, again, these are interesting for strange commodities too. And then we've got the big uh, basins where we have coal and oil, wells, um, and you know, early studies from North Dakota suggest that some of these flat-lying, muddy coal beds and uh, you know, relatively boring sedimentary rocks may also have significant concentrations of rare earth elements and other critical commodities. The last thing I want to say about this is that all those little black dots are abandoned mine sites in the state. Okay, I'm going to embarrass Phyllis here because she's here. Um, this is really great data for what I'm doing right now. I mean, you know, of course I always wish there was more, but that is a huge data set and you know, Phyllis was part of the group that went out and collected a lot of this data, boots on the ground, all over the state, to characterize some of these sites. Um, they didn't do anything related to critical commodities. They did stuff related to environmental quality, but the reports are very useful because they it summarizes really what was known about a lot of these districts in a really easy to read way. It also helps locate these properties, okay? So what we're doing is saying, okay, we have all this data, we've got historic production. When you go and look back at the historic production from all this data, it's a lot, mostly silver and gold, right? Because that's what people used to want. And we still do want that, but we want more than that now. And so back when the original studies were done, there was no, no concern with any critical commodities, okay? That was just not, not, of interest. So we've got a tremendous opportunity here, this is what I've pitched, to go back and revisit all these sites and characterize them, do assays on, on some of the rocks and see what's in them. 
There's a periodic table that shows you the critical commodities, at least what they were when I put this slide together. And I say that because what is considered critical in this country is changing all the time. And it depends on supply chains, global supply chains, which drives the price of the commodity. Uh, and it also drives, uh, it's driven by demand, both local and global. Okay, so we're kind of in a tight spot here these days because a lot of these commodities we, we rely on other countries for importing the material we, I think, pretty much take for granted. Okay, so there's a couple options here. We need to figure out how to make the global supply chain work better for our needs, or we need to develop our own <coughs> stockpiles and resources again. Um, and I think that, that, that the latter might be where it's headed. Um, okay, so here, here we are, lithium, beryllium, magnesium is a critical commodity. I mean, you know, these are, these are real, oftentimes abundant, uh, common elements uh, and we just they're critical to our everyday lives and we, and we need to ensure that we have these we want to keep living the way we do uh, and just to you know drive that point home even further energy you know we hear this green the green transition is coming any day now well that's going to take a lot of mining Elements like indium, gallium, selenium, neodymium. Uh, I'm not even going to try that last one. <laughs> these, we need all these things to go into building this new green infrastructure. Okay, so we either need to import these things to map globe, so the global supply chains, or we need to have these things. Right? Healthcare. I mean, who thought that yttrium or yttrium? Uh, I can't read that one. That's okay. Europium, I mean, cesium. These are things that we use in, in the machines when we go to the doctor. Okay, We need to have these things to build these machines so the doctor can see what's wrong with us. Defense national security. Most of these things are alloys that harden steel, and they're pretty obscure, but we need them to harden steel if we're going to be competitive and protected. Cars, lithium, carbon, cobalt, nickel. You know, it's um, these things are are trivial, trivial, and we understand now that that we're in a tight spot as far as developing them. So we've assembled a team of really, really smart and nice people. Uh, there's Adrian on the top. He comes to us from the University of Toronto. He's um, He's really impressive in front of his microscope ability. He loves looking at, at microscopes. He worked on the Bear Lodge project in Wyoming and took the Bear Lodge as a rare earth project. And he started on that project from prospect to mine development. So this guy has an enormous understanding of the process from start to stop with mining. And so he brings that to the group, which is really nice. Amanda just got a master's degree at the University of Wyoming. She's really new. She's got her hands in a lot of things at the Bureau, but she's been a tremendous help also to, the, to our research group uh, in particular. Uh, so she's helping out. Um, Kyle, I see his mother was here. Uh, he's at work, actually, he has to stay at work. Uh, so Kyle's great. He's a really, really happy to be here. He loves minerals. He loves really strange minerals. So he's our minerals guy. And he's just like a puppy dog when he's out there looking at rocks. He brings a lot of energy and a lot of brains, and I really am happy to have him here. Jeff Lawn is a mapping geologist that um, knows a lot about belt rocks across the state. We have some mineral deposits in belt rocks. We have a project on the Idaho-Montana border where those rocks are, so Jeff's helping out with that. Ryan Davison, uh, he's uh, got a master's degree. He's a geologist also in the Billings office. He's in charge of the effort to look at coal beds to see what the rare earth element content is stratigraphically in coal horizons in the eastern part of the state. 
Uh, and then John Sanford, he's our new uh, GIS manager. He's taken, taken us kind of out of the paper and onto the digital web design. Very good, in a very nice, easy to use way. So if you haven't seen our web page lately, I would encourage you to look at it. There's some, there's some really nice data exploration tools you can use, fairly easy on there. Uh, and then the other people that I'm not showing pictures of, uh, we didn't show a picture of Jay. Uh, he's kind of the main guy of Billings. Well, we also got a bunch of uh, summer interns that were training up this summer to map. We've got Jasmine, we've got Chris, who we had no idea could fly drones, but has brought drones out and, and is taking these beautiful mosaics of our field area. We have Karina, uh, we have Sarah Reisdorf, who's leading the effort to map out Sheep Creek. This is where she did her master's project. Uh, just finished a two-year master's with Chris Gammons looking at the Sheep Creek deposit, and so now we've hired her to go back out and lead a mapping effort. And then my new baby grad student, Everett, is here. <laughs> He's just been here two, three weeks. He's really excited to be here. We're getting about the field this afternoon, finally. Um, and then contract, we've got my old field camp professor, John Dillis, on the job. And so he was out here for three weeks uh, mapping, and I'm gonna go meet Joe, Utah State, right after this talk, um, right So we've got a lot of people that are out <coughs> doing, the, doing the work, and we're all really excited by it, so it's really a pleasure to get to, get to talk about it. Um, we've got, you know, all these grants have let us kind of also buy some toys, okay? And this isn't even the complete list. We've gotten things uh, since this. Uh, but we've got a really good uh, lab manager, Connie. Um, the group really grew after the pandemic. I think we hired something like 20 young early career people in the last couple of years. So it's kind of a new thing going on up there. Uh, we're sharing a lot of lab space and a lot of equipment because the program that I kind of stepped out of, the state map program, has also been growing. Okay, so by me stepping out, it's just a lot more new early career people come into the mapping part. Um, and so the things are growing and we're sharing a lot of lab space and we're getting new toys. Uh, and Connie's kind of making sure everybody plays nice together and all the rocks we bring in from the field go to the right place by the right time. And so it's been great to have that. Um, ultimately, you know, our, our, our goal is to assay a lot of rocks from abandoned mines and other mineral systems throughout the state and put it up on the web, publicly facing, uh, and de deliver it digitally to the public, or, or all you guys. Uh, projects, okay, so uh, real quickly go through this. Uh, we're working on one project we have is with the Army Research Labs, and this is a a uh, year-by-year project to characterize abandoned mine sites by geologic province. So for example, one year we'll look at the mineral systems and the critical commodity potential of something like, say, the Boulder Batholith, okay? Uh, another year we might do the Phillipsburg Batholith. Another year we might do the Central Montana Alcalic province, okay? So that's the scale of the Army Research Labs. Work. We were also funded through uh, the USGS, it's called the Earth Mapping Resources Initiative. And this is one of the, bi one of the only bipartisan issues in Washington right now. This, uh, the infrastructure bill flooded this program with money. Okay? And all that money is going down to states to do this kind of work. Um, so we've got two of those projects going right now. And they're each three year deals, they come with 200 bulk geochemical assays credits. So basically, they say, okay, here's your money, you've got three years, give us two quad maps, and send us 200 rocks. Okay, and so we're doing that in two places right now. We're doing that on the east side of the Boulder Batholith near Raidersburg, and we're also doing that on the Montana-Idaho border uh, in the Sheep Creek Rare Earth District in conjunction with the Idaho Geologic Survey. Um, we're also, has anybody seen that helicopter with the weird probe on it? Yes. Yeah. And so we've been working with the USGS to do that. And so last summer they flew 
Well, they got Rio Tinto to come in and double it, but I, I was the one that started that with the USGS, the idea to, to fly over that area. And we were able to get something together. Rio Tinto liked the idea, doubled the size of it. Their, their part of the survey is going to remain hidden for one year, but then it'll be public. Um, yeah, and I've seen that data, it's really good. Um, we've got a mineral symposium here in September where the lead scientist in charge of this geophysical project is gonna present results of the study. So that'll be up at the Tech campus uh, in September. Um, they're flying another one this summer that's the exact same size as the one they did before. So the one they did before was large, but then they said, well, we didn't get viewed. So then they took the footprint from the first one and basically shifted it over west. And so that's what they're doing this summer. They're also flying pieces down in the Idaho-Montana border uh, where we're working with Idaho. Uh, and then there's another little patch in between that they're working on. But I think over the next five years, their goal is to fly most of southwest Montana for new geophysical data. And by geophysical data, what I mean is aeromagnetics and radiometrics. Aeromagnetics are basically like getting a CAT scan of the Earth. Okay, it'll show you. It'll. It's color coded the data. The hot spots or the reds are where you have a lot of magnetite. As it cools off, there's less magnetite. Okay, and so. You know, the team of scientists has to work together to figure out what those anomalies mean, but the resolution and the quality of the data is so much better than what we've had before. It's just really exciting for, for people that aren't even working on mineral deposits, okay? Because it's just such an interesting, it'll help us with understand the geology on a variety of fronts, this data will. Um, the, the radiometrics are measuring the radioactive wavelengths of certain materials that are emitting radiation, okay? And different rocks have different signals, and you can measure that, and again, color code it. So specifically, we're looking at uranium, thorium, and potassium in those channels, and each one has a different color. And so the maps you produce with the radiometrics are also color-coded, but they're telling you different things than the magnetics. They're telling you, oh, these rocks have more potassium, less thorium, and more uranium. Oh, well, that's the boulder batholith. Okay, so we can go and do those kind of things with these new data sets, just by what we know about the rocks, and then what these radiometrics are telling us. It's like a it's like using Google Earth to look at the road before you go out there, right? And so it really gives us a nice, nice head start um, to do work that's not usually easy. Okay, key tasks um, of the program. You know, I'm gonna put the bottom one first. This is really the big push right now. We need, we need to to reinvigorate a young generation of mineral explorers is what we need, okay? And so this is what our team is really doing. Kyle in particular, myself, are devoting a lot of time to training, to training these young folks that are really interested in doing this work, okay? And so I think that's really what the big push of our uh, program is. We're also really uh, involved with data preservation. We work with Denise here, who runs our data preservation office up at uh, Tech. Um, and so by data preservation, I mean we have folders and folders and folders and folders and folders of papers, work separated by county, stacked in, what do you call this? Compact storage. Compact storage. We've got drawers with maps that are produced by consultants that have never been published. Um, so, you know, we get prospectors coming in looking at property and they, they'll spend half a day looking through what we have in our archives before they go out. And so, you know, our goal is to say, okay, well, what is this, kid, what is the most important piece of this here? Because it's so overwhelming, there's so much of it. And so we need to focus in on what the big sites are statewide uh, and make sure that we can preserve and share that data uh, with the public, but also use it to guide our, our, our future studies. Okay, 
Um, so the regional assessment's a critical commodity. That's really the ARL work. That's like the geologic province scale thing that we're doing. The district scale, this is this is my wheelhouse. This is what I love. Okay, this is the one to 24,000 quad mapping. Uh, like I said, you know, I'm in two of those this summer. It's always which one do I go to? Where do I go? Um, but you know, this is collecting rocks, looking at the geochemical data, taking pan and stream sets, seeing what's in the heavies. Um, you know, that can tell you some things. Uh, soil samples also, mapping out alteration. We've got a bunch of nifty little handheld tools where we can measure magnetics on the ground. Uh, we can measure radiometrics on the ground. Uh, this scale. Um, we also have handheld XRFs where we can measure concentrations of materials in real time while we're mapping. Um, so yeah, that, that's the fun stuff to me. Dep deposit scale, this kind of also fits within the 1 to 24. So for example, in Raiders, uh, Raidersburg, we're going to make a quad map, the 60 square miles, but we're also going to focus in on a couple of the really nice historic mine pieces like Diamond Hill, where there's been a lot of digging and a lot of activity, and we'll map that at a different scale. Basically, we'll take the 24 scale, put it on the copy machine, and enlarge it by 200%. And now we're mapping at 1 to 24,000, or 1 to 12,000, I'm sorry. And so each of those, sorry to jump around here so much, but uh, we're kind of looking at things at all scales, is the point I'm trying to make. We're looking at things really closely, like mine scale, to, to really high above, like geologic provenance scale. Um, okay, so now I'll give you some pictures here real quick about where these projects are. Um, so the, the two, or the, the black box on the right there, kind of just uh, east of Butte. That's the geophysical survey that the USGS polluted last summer. Uh, the one they're working on right now, this summer, uh, is the blue box just west. Okay, you know, so right just filling in all that, all that area is really nice. It's got a nice big area. And then you move over to the Idaho, Montana border. They're flying this this summer, and I believe, I'm not even showing, but they've got, they managed to sneak this piece in even too, okay? So there's a lot of uh, aeromag being flown this summer. Um, the quad mapping we're doing is, is in Giant Hill and Raidersburg. I don't know my family's walking around. Right. <laughs> um, and before that, I had a map in, uh, I had a project in Elkhorn, and this was kind of the first year the program started, so they weren't really sure what they were doing. Um, they've gotten more organized since then, but they gave me one quad, they gave me one year, they gave me $100,000 and they gave me 100 assays. And that was just a start, just to see how it went. Okay, and so that was the first year, got that one done. That was up in, included Elkhorn Peak and Crow Peak, up kind of west of, uh, yeah, northeast of Boulder. That was a lot of fun. And so now we're moving just east of that and we're doing Raidersburg and Giant Hill Quad for the next two years, next three years. And then in conjunction, we're also working in Sheep Creek. Um, we're also doing a day, data preservation project. And this is kind of neat, too, because we got money to build a new building. And so we've got a big sample storage facility that's being built on campus right now to put all these rocks into once we, as, as we're collecting them. They're all in Kyle's office right now. Okay. Um, so we're working uh, with a PhD student that's working with Chris Cannons up at Tech. Uh, her name's Celine. And her PhD is focused on the Phillipsburg Mining District. And so we wrote a proposal to basically archive and analyze Celine's samples. 
Okay, so we'll help her with her PhD work because she'll get 200 assays to look at from her minds. Um, and it'll also help us with our mission to archive some of these mine sites throughout the state. So uh, that project's going really well, and it's also led to other projects. So for example, uh, the ge Geo Department in Bozeman has reached out to us about archiving specimens from professors that are no longer there. And some of these collections are really nice. They've got um, you know, pieces of ore from really famous mines all over the world. So we said, sure, yeah, we'll take those. And so we're working now to do that. Uh, again, those samples, in theory, will all be photo slabbed, photographed, assayed, with all that information being streamed out to the public uh, through our, our web interface. Uh, and then uh, U of M has also reached out about doing a similar thing, because they have a bunch of old rocks sitting around from professors that are no longer there, and so they're all looking for a home, and, and we're turning into that home, and so that's good. Here's uh, our storage, compact storage. Uh, again, property files all organized by county. Uh, there's some real interesting uh, stuff in here. Denise has done a really nice job of uh, organizing it and keeping it so people don't walk out with it. Um, yeah, and so, you know, day to day, you know, another real exciting thing is that the data preservation group was a one time only, uh, one time only funding opportunity when I first got hired here, and then it got, became one time, five more times, eight more times, and then finally it just got put into as a line item in the budget. So our data preservation group is solid. Finally, for the first time, it's 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 there, so that's good. Then they're not worrying if it's going to be there or not. The, the state government has recognized the importance of the work we're doing with preserving this information, so they've just made us part of their appropriation, which is really great. Um, current projects, dope books. So this is if anybody's met Tony Roth, this is his. This is his. Uh, I think his. The reason he was, he exists. He loves the Stoke books. Okay, you, you get him talking about the Stoke books, he won't stop. Uh, he's always looking for another one. He has that it's like a treasure hunt. He thinks he knows where some are. He's always getting new ones. And if you don't know what the Stoke books are, the Stoke books are really great works of art and science. These were done by really talented geologists when they were mining underground. The Anaconda Company. And they did amazing work. They used compasses and pencils and pens, and they mapped all the workings, all the geology, all the workings on the ground. Okay? And it's just amazing. And something like 300 books or something like that, which shows every level. And if you want to get, not, uh, get a better uh, understanding, I should take a picture for this talk, and go into the bureau and look, right before you get to the pub's office, look to your left, there's a big model of the hill that shows all the underground workings. And it's really cool. And so the stove books are basically records from every single one of those drifts that was mapped by a geologist as it was being mined out. And so we're preserving all that information. I know that one of the companies in town, Blackjack, has been interested in some of that information uh, from exploration modeling. Um, so that's something we've been working on for a while. Um, the Peabird project is, uh, again, with Celine, we're working on that actively, as well as sample collections from other universities. Um, yeah, just more specifics about the active projects. Um, that went the wrong way. Okay. Uh, here's a couple, here's Jasmine and Connie, our lab manager and Sarah looking at uh, some of Celine's samples that they've just brought over and slabbed and are now um, putting away for archive. Okay, so this is our lab, uh, one of our labs up there. Here's what one of the slabs look, looks like. Okay, and so this is um, 
really what we're trying to do is cut these things in half, put them on a scanner, like a cheap scanner you buy for a hundred bucks, get a good picture, you know, get these things wet, put them on a scanner, get a picture, um, and then attach an assay to it. And that's kind of the extent of the preservation work, and then we'll just do interpretations of the data in terms of prospectivity over larger areas. Uh, here's some of the people. So there's Jeff Lawn. He's um, it's a later later career now, even though he probably never stopped. Matt Bean, geologist, and there's John, kind of the same thing. Um, he actually started his career in Raidersburg in the 70s with Exxon. And so he's really happy to be back out here at the end of his career, because he still has questions, of course. You know, and so um, it's pretty cool. There's Kyle and Amanda in Raidersburg. Um, so one, you know, a little more detail about some of these projects. Raidersburg District, two quads. Uh, the main mineral system there is porphyry copper, uh, but also silver, lead, and zinc loads, but also replacements and scarns. So there's a lot of different mineral systems, and this is what the USGS likes about regions like this, is you're not just looking at one thing. You're not just looking for commodities potentially associated with the porphyry. Here we've got porphyries, we've got scarns, we've got loads, and so they're all slightly different mineral systems. Uh, they're all in the same area. There's Chris, he's a budding field mapper, but also a master drone pilot. And so he's taken some really interesting drone flights. Um, and it's really nice to be able to see some of these areas that we're about ready to traverse. It's like a bird, I love it. Um, okay, Sheep Creek, again, uh, this is the, the, the second uh, quad mapping project we're doing. Uh, here, the system is um, rare earth and niobium bearing carbonatites. The country out here is really challenging. There's a lot of logging roads, uh, but it's completely different than Raidersburg. And so it's, it's interesting to kind of compare and contrast these um, geologic settings and mineral systems. And I think we have the expertise to do it with all the people we have on the projects. So that's good. Again, just a little more detail about the geophysical surveys. Uh, the one they flew before is completed. That data has been processed. It's beautiful, and it will be presented uh, up at Tech in September, the Mining and Mineral Symposium. We're still an embargo by Rio Tinto on the southern half. This is being flown right now. You know, again, thinking you're going to come up with, you know, something like two million dollars to do new geophysics. As a geologist, you wouldn't think that. Okay, this this is finally some real money being thrown at the problem, which is encouraging. Um, and so, one thing to notice here is this huge box. This huge box is what they want to fly eventually in the next five years. They want to get data that goes basically all the way up into Canada and down into Idaho, and they're calling this the Great Falls Tectonic Zone Geologic Province. Okay, it's got a lot of porphyries, it's got a lot of different uh, types of mineral deposits. Now, but this has been identified as a priority uh, for the USGS Earth MRI program for acquiring this type of data specifically for exploration. It's a large piece of land. This is an example of what some of that data looks like for the Raidersburg quadrangle. Okay, so we've got the radiometrics on the left. Potassium is red, thorium is green, and uranium is blue. Okay, so it's just an example of how you can use these data to show you different signals in the rocks. And then over here, we've got the aeromagnetics. And so these big red hot spots are showing you places where we have elevated concentrations of magnetite. Okay. 
And one thought is it's just showing you where the Elkhorn Mountain volcanics are. Okay, the Elkhorn <coughs> Mountain volcanics are andesitic volcanic deposits that consist of anything from lahars to lava flows to tufts to intrusions, but they're mostly andesitic. And the significance of that is andesites have more iron and magnesium in them than, say, the boulder batholith, which is pretty silicic. It's got a lot of quartz in it, not a lot of iron and magnesium. So, so the air magnetics are interesting because they let us test that idea. Are these Elkhorn Mountain volcanics or not? Okay, so they're not, so then why do we have iron magnetics? These kind of things. Or we'll go and look at a sulfide vein and we'll see the metal in it and we'll see that there's no magnetics. What? Why not? Why are these not magnetic? And it's because the whole thing has been flooded with silica and all the magnetite has been taken out. And so, so these kind of data sets are really helpful for our studies and it's, it's really great that we're getting this kind of information. Okay, now I'm going to transition real quickly and just kind of talk about some of the other stuff that's going on. Um, that was, I think you guys got a good feel for, for what I've got myself into. Um, this is Adrian. He kind of inherited this project when we hired him. Uh, you know, so the ARL, the ARL grant was a, was a big one. And essentially our director went around and asked, grabbed five people and said, there you go, take it, go do this. And so we did. Uh, we didn't have enough people to do the work when we got the grant, so we hired Adrian. Adrian took, immediately came in with a project, in charge of a project. Uh, and so his game is to go out and look at abandoned phosphate mines throughout the state and look specifically at the concentrations of critical commodities and rare elements in the phosphoria formation. He's doing that in Montana, but he's also working uh, across the border with Ida, with scientists from Idaho and the Wyoming survey, uh, because the unit doesn't just stop at the state borders. And so, so we're kind of getting a collaborative picture of what uh, that unit, what kind of resources might be in that, uh, in that rock unit. Um, so here's what the data looks like. Uh, rare earths uh, are oftentimes called the lanthanides. These are on the bottom here from left to right. Um, and what we're showing here is that in terms of rare earth elements, we've got these things concentrated um, up to a, 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 an order, a factor of three. Uh, so a thousand times more than you would expect them to be in a chondrite, okay, and so chondrite is what petrologists use or consider what the solar system is made out of. It's the whole composition of the solar system is what chondrite is, okay. So compared to the bulk composition of the solar system, the phosphoria formation has a thousand times more rare earth elements for some of these things and, you know, up to a hundred at least for almost all of them, okay. <coughs> So, and then you say, well, what, so what does that mean? Why, why do I care? And, you know, that's a good question because we still have to process all this stuff, right? And in order for something to be mined, it has to be economic. And in order for it to be economic, it has to be a certain price. And so, you know, I, I see people here that are in the, in, have been in the mining industry, and, you know, that's a fine line. That depends on what the price of metal is every day. It depends on whether you can get investors to pitch in, kick in money to do the, do the work. Um, so, you know, all we're doing is providing this background information. This is, these are the assays. This is the data over wide regions. You guys can decide if it's economic or not to go in there and get it out. And, you know, just to take it one step further, I don't know that we even have the technology to process some of this stuff yet. And so there's part of the ARL project that I keep alluding to is the processing piece, right? Okay, so now we have the material, but how do we concentrate the commodity and make money doing it? 
So here's a Phosphoria formation under a microscope. Um, so I, I guess what Adrian's finding, and so we, we've got some really nifty tools actually up at Tech. One of the good tools we have is called a SEM, and what it can do is automated neurology. And what that means is that the microscope has been tuned in to do a really high resolution scan of a polished thin section, so a really zoomed in version on a rock, and to basically tell you what all the minerals are, but not just what they are, what their atomic compositions are. Okay, so yeah, it's gold, but or it's electrum, but it's 75 gold, 25 silver. We can get that kind of detail for all these minerals. Uh, so that's one of the, also one of the tools we're using is not just to identify the deposit, but to identify the minerals in the deposit that are going to be what you really want to focus on. And so it's, it's kind of neat to have the brains and the toys to be doing this kind of stuff. And when I say brains, I'm not talking about mine. <laughs> Other people we hired here. Um, so these are, uh, they're called uh, peloids, but what they are, they're, they're phos phosphate-rich buoids. Uh, buoids are those little sand grains that roll back and forth in the shoreline environment and kind of gather up little um, calcareous uh, blobs and then get cemented together over time. Here's an image of the automated mineralogy on the SEM up at Tech. A false color image from CAMP, which is the Center of Advanced Mineral Processing. That's up at Tech. Test scan, SEM. SEM means scanning electron microscope. Showing the modal mineralogy. Okay, so the modal mineralogy is on the right here. And that's basically saying, okay, we scanned your slide, and it is made up of this, 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 and it all adds up to 100%. Mm -hmm. Okay, before, you used to have to do point counting on a microscope, and that's like going around and counting points on a slide all day, and then coming up with really what's a subjective answer. Okay, this is way more quantitative, um, and, it, and it does uh, nice work. So I don't think I showed you. So here we're just looking at the phases, but then you can center the beam on the phase, like let's say quartz, and you can zap it, and it'll tell you exactly the atomic composition of the quartz. So all minerals, quartz, anything, they're not purely SiO2, or whatever the formula says they are. They have impurities in them too. And you know, the critical commodities, and, and uh, materials, oftentimes that's what we're looking for, some of these more obscure substitution things, why is this happening sort of situation. Um, Hydrocarbon investigation program, this is Jay Gunderson, he's, um, he's been basically given uh, legislative mon money uh, from the Montana uh, government to answer two questions, he's got two mandates. The first one is to determine if new methods of oil and gas production will improve production in existing oil and gas fields. Um, so really, what Jay is trying to do is make a bunch of subsurface formation maps. Okay, so for anybody that's familiar with oil and gas, you've got traps, right? You've got units that are permeable or porous where oil can migrate through and then it gets to a certain level and it hits something where it can't get through because it's not porous and it gets trapped. Okay, so again, an example of that would be like sandstone, mudstone, sandstone, mudstone, right? And so, so that's where you get oil, but then when you buckle or fold the whole thing, where do you think the oil goes? Right into all the cracks and right into all the hinges of the folds. Okay, so what Jay wants to do is to make these statewide subsurface top of formation maps. And then what that involves is contouring specific intervals where there are rich oil plays and may project them into the subsurface. 
And he's doing that for several different oil producing units through the state. He's doing it at the state scale. It's a really ambitious project. And some of the stuff he, some of the logs that he brings into work sometimes are, wow, that's a lot. Here's what one looks like. Um, you know, it probably just kind of looks like a map, but what this is is actually a structure contour map, which is showing you the elevation of that unit in the subsurface. Which is not intuitive, but that's when you're drilling, that's what you're doing. You're going into the subsurface and you're basically getting a picture into the ground at certain elevations. Okay, and you and then once you get that hole, you can drop in a series of instruments that measure things like resistivity, conductivity, and those are all interpreted as reflecting changes in stratigraphy or rock units. And that's what Jay's done for his whole career. He's picked, picked the tops and the bottoms of all these units from all these wells throughout the whole eastern part of the state, and he's coming up with some really interesting ideas. So if you're interested in that or, or learning more about that, I would encourage you to reach out to Jay or Ryan Davison in our billings office. Ryan, uh, also really happy to be uh, doing his work. Hundreds of cold maps and data points from the early 1900s to present. Uh, he's digitized these and brought them into his project because again, he's finding himself in a situation, similar situation as me. There's all this historic data, but it's all focused on exploring for something we're not after today, right? And so that's what he's doing, is he's bringing all that historic data into his project, and he's going back out and revisiting that data and adding, using the, our new toys and his assays to bring in the commodity piece to it. Um, yeah, and here's Ryan's contact number. He's a really nice guy. If you have any interest in, in any more of this, I really encourage you to reach out to him. He'd be happy to talk about it. Um, you know, he just kind of sent me these slides at the last minute to, to give some scope of what he's doing. But, you know, these are nice pretty pictures of central and eastern Montana. Yeah, picture Ryan walking up and down these sections, taking samples. That's what he's doing. All right, here's me looking at a lava flow in Raidersburg, uh, trying to stay away from the rain. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Don't do much. <laughs>